So again, my name is AJ Leeming. I'm your host uh, from CSI Ontario. And the guy that we're all here to hear from tonight is Warren Javit. And I'm going to hand the mic his way in just a moment. Warren uh, kicked this series off with us last season, played a uh, great presenter's role, lots of interesting things to get us thinking about at the start of the season. And he's back with us again this year to kick it off um, to talk a little bit about thinking, training, and skiing better. And Warren, without further ado, I will hand things your way. I'll be on mute in the background. If you need me, give me a holler and we'll pick up some questions at the end. Thanks again for being here and everybody else, enjoy. Awesome, thank you, AJ. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking the time out to tonight to, to join us. And uh, I'm really excited about this, this session or this whole series. And it starts with Think Better. And uh, we'll, we'll get into that here. Uh, well, a couple of things as we go through it, I've got three videos that I'll be showing. Um, there is a small little delay in the action from when I pause things and move on to the videos and so on and so forth. So be patient. It, sometimes there's a little pause uh, as some of those come up on, on the screen and, uh, and play from there. But um, I'm going to get this rolling. My very first slide here, uh, some of you might know this person. Uh, there, that skier, uh, one of my mentors. <laughs> this is Natalie Jobbit, age five and three quarters. Uh, just yesterday at breakfast, and I don't even know, I can't remember what the conversation was, but she says, you know what? She says to, to myself and, and my wife, Alex, says, skiing is a really big skill. And <laughs> I thought about that. We laughed. We do, I don't know where it came from. And, uh, but, uh, you know, it kind of is. And it made me think a little bit about skiing and the fact that, you know, we can look at skiing, just changing direction, going top of the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill as one giant skill. Uh, we can also break it down. We can go all the way down to the little nitty gritty, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, about how we roll our ankles and our pinky toes and our big toes and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, I urge you as we go through tonight to take a step back and uh you know i always tell people try to hit control alt delete and take the data in take the information in uh, as it rolls tonight and you know hopefully it makes you think uh maybe a little bit about different a little bit differently about skiing because uh, in my opinion if we want to change our skiing the very first thing we have to do is change the way we think about skiing if the way we formulate skiing, the way we picture it in our head, uh, the way we think about it doesn't change, it's going to be very hard to create a new motor pattern. And so that's what tonight's all about. I hope that it will cue in a few different thoughts maybe about uh, how you think about skiing. I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. And that's kind of the, the, the agenda for this evening. We're going to keep things simple. We're going to talk about skiing being objective-based. We're going to talk about some of the things we do on our skis and a little bit why we do it that way. And then there's the how, the actual technical components. How does the body move to make skiing work the way that we want it to work? We're going to start out here, you know, in the simple sort of idea that if you think about skiing, every move you make, so whether it's lifting an arm up or bending a joint or anything like that, the end result must affect the skis on the surface of the snow. If it doesn't, then it's an extraneous movement that will likely get us into trouble at some point or take away from the real solid foundation of what skiing really is. And at the end of the day, what do we do with our skis? We can either tip them over or we can twist them on the surface of the snow, right? Turn the ski on the surface of the snow. That's going to affect our turn shape. Our turn shape can be big or small. It can go big across the hill or small across the hill. It can go big down the hill or small down the hill. It can be carved or less carved, skidded, drifted, whatever terminology that you like to use. And it can be fast or slow. I can move down the mountain quite quickly. I can go from the top to the bottom in 30 seconds. I can go top to bottom in 45 seconds. Or I can also think about my speed on an arc. I can be skiing. You know, I can put in a couple of extra turns faster on the arc and still keep my same rate of descent down the mountain. So these are the things that uh, are results of what it is that we do with our skis on the snow. So let's take a look at our first video here. And it's going to talk a little bit about objective driven skiing.
Let's talk about objective-based skiing. You know, unless you're planning on going straight down the mountain, you know, we're all on some sort of arc, right? And we can describe those arcs in the following ways. So number one, uh, we can talk about the, um, the corridor that we're going to be skiing, how wide that corridor might be. And that's simply this, from one fall line all the way over to the next, how far across the mountain are you going uh, per turn? Now we've also got the vertical drop. So same sort of thing from as you're going across the slope until you change direction completely to the other way, how far down the mountain are you going on each arc at that point? So you've got those two to describe sort of the size, how wide and how far down the mountain you go per arc. Ski performance, here's a good one, right? So we've got one here where the skis may be a little bit more skidded or the turn shape's a bit more skidded, where here it's a little bit more carved where you dig in a little bit more and leave a thinner line in the snow. We would compare those to here. Oops, sorry. Try that again. Compare those two. You can see the difference, right? Where one's a little bit more skidded, throwing up a lot more snow, where here quite a bit more carved. Okay, so ski performance is our third sort of way to evaluate. Now let's take a look at this a little bit more in depth. Okay, so the skier on the, the right versus the skier on the left. So the skier on the left, we've got a blue groomed slope, um, not super steep, whereas the skier on the right side of the screen, it's a much steeper slope. And the overall goal on these two runs was to move down the mountain at the same speed. So our fourth sort of consideration as well as speed, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But we're moving down the mountain at the same rate. Now look at the difference in corridor width as we do this one. To keep the same speed, the skier on the left has to be pointing more down the hill, where the skier on the right has to come more across the hill. Right? Again, this one's controlling the speed and this one's letting it go a little bit. So the overall rate of descent would be this, roughly the, the same speed. <clears throat> okay, and we take a look now. Let's look at, you know, some of the, the technical components to, uh, to achieve this. And we're not changing a lot, right? Between these two skiers, it's not, you know, if, you know, one turn shape more than the other means a whole new technique. Right. So what this means here is you know, very similar technique, but the skier on the right has to get the skis tipped over more to be able to carve their turn and control their rate of descent down the mountain where the skier on the left can be a little bit more less edge angle. And that will help that skier go more down the slope and control their speed or keep their speed up because it's a little bit flatter on that piece of terrain. OK, so here, you know, again, looking at technique. There's not a lot different uh, between those two skiers, but it's that use of technique or technical skills that are going to allow us to change and vary our turn shapes. Again, you can see the skier here, you're both in the fall line. This skier on the, the right side of the screen has to tip over quite a bit more, get the skis tipped over more to carve to control their turn shape where this skier is tipping them a bit less to come a little bit more down the slope. There we go. So let's take a little bit deeper look at the uh, at the vertical drop. <clears throat> okay, so vertical drop. You know this. Excuse me. Now this is a very steep black run. Um, the terrain's pretty firm on on this. The snowpack's pretty firm, as firm as it gets at, uh, at Sunshine Village, of course. Um, but you'll watch. You know, I have to get the skis sort of across the hill pretty darn fast, right? And you look at the. It's a. I'm trying to have a carve, so a ski performance type turn. Um, you know, the how steep this ski angle has to be. That edge angle has to be really steep to be able to get the ski to bend enough. To come back across the hill so I'm not coming down the hill much and that's how you're controlling the speed in a performance arc. And you'll notice that that edge angle has to continue to increase and stay uh, until I'm facing more across the hill because that's how I'm going to control my speed coming down the hill right to, to get across but that edge angle has got to stay pretty long throughout that arc. And then release, same thing, build it up, get the vertical drop as low, you know, as quickly as possible or as short as possible and get going back 
across the hill. Well, let's take a look at this one. Now, this is a little less steep, uh, this piece of terrain. The snow is still groomed, uh, nice and grippy. Uh, and so in order to ski at the speed that I wanted to, I didn't need to shrink or you know kind of compress that time in the fall line as much. And look at the difference. Okay, so look at how far down the hill I go. However, because it's a performance turn, you'll see that that maximum edge angle is quite a bit further along the arc, but you still get there. Okay, so look at the difference uh, here between the two. It's going to be pretty neat when you see the two comparisons here. Okay, so there's that carved arc, but the edge angle develops much, much later in the arc. So you can see very similar edge angles, right? How steep that ski is, is tipped over. But on that steeper terrain where I had to really shrink that vertical drop, I had to get the skis, that edge angle, way above the fall line. Whereas on this one where I'm just trying to control the arc and keep a nice carved arc, it's quite a bit after the fall line. So you can still get to the same edge angle, but where that happens in the arc will completely change your vertical drop. Okay, so ski performance. Um, now this is a neat comparison actually. So the uh, in the when I'm in the yellow suit there, that's a blue run. It's groomed, and uh, but the snow conditions between the two are very similar. The bottom skier is a black run. So on the top one, the overall goal ski performance is more of a carved arc. Uh, because I'm not concerned about the slope and the terrain going too fast. But on the black run on the bottom, uh, I have to control my speed. So using a short turn for two completely different objectives as far as ski performance goes. And if you watch the, uh, the skier on top with a little bit more ski performance here, you notice that that carries my momentum more across the slope because I can, right? Um, but the skier on the bottom, you know, the momentum, I'm trying to slow myself down right there, looking at the bottom half of the screen, trying to slow myself down there. So at that point, I've got to actually turn the skis a little bit, got to turn them across my direction so I can create a little bit more of a skidded arc, less carved arc, and uh, control that rate of descent down the mountain. Now, again, the comparison between the two, uh, there's not a lot of difference other than look at the, how much the skis are, you know, they're you know, they're a little bit more tipped over at the top, but here they've got to turn right across my direction of travel to slow myself down. So it's a little bit more of a skidded arc at that point. Very similar, you know, the way we stand on the ski and, uh, and that sort of thing. However, it's just how much the ski is turned across the direction of travel, which is going to change the uh, level of ski performance being more carved at the top versus more skidded at the bottom. I love this one here where, you know, I talk a lot about speed on an arc. You can come down the mountain pretty fast, right? Or can you ski fast on the arc and not move down the mountain quite as quick? And this really represents that quite well. Uh, just by fluke, this, <laughs> this camera angle came out, uh, perfectly for this demonstration. So, um, looking at the skier, we're going to compare the skier on the front to the, the skier on the back. And you can see right off the bat, very similar in the way that we're standing on our skis. Pole plants are pretty much ready at the same time, run very similar uh, skis. Um, so that's going to create, should create with the same movement pattern, should create a rel you know, almost the exact same turn shape. But look at what happens here, right? So as we get rolling and uh, so skiing across the slope, so you can see you know, in there, movement patterns are the same, right? We're starting to tip the ski over, very similar. We were balancing on the outside ski and how much the ski is tipped over, right? So that's pretty similar above the fall line here. And then from there, as we progress, the turn shapes are the same at this point. You've got similar angles again. The skis are pretty much the same. So you've, you know, when the skiers move the same way at the same time, on the same equipment, you're going to have the same sort of vertical drop and same turn shape. Okay, now look at what happens when the skier at the back, uh, from here again, very similar the way we're skiing, um, the rate in which I tip the ski over and the degree how much I tip the ski over is going to change compared to the skier in the front. And look at what happens to the turn shape. 
right? So all of a sudden, now by the time we get to the fall line, look at the difference. So tipped over more, tipped over faster. Uh, we're a very similar place in the arc. However, m these skis, my skis have already started to bend and arc towards the fall line where these ones aren't as much because I've got the ski tipped over more and it's tipped over faster. Now what's, look what's going to happen relative to the speed. Okay, the skier in the front, the skier in the back, get to the same point in the fall line, right to there. But now watch, from this movement on, you'll see that the skier in the back actually goes faster across the slope, where the skier in the front is still not even um, finished the the previous the previous arc. And this is how I've you know gone faster on the arc itself. Okay, so I'm already starting to tip the skis over to create the new arc where the skier in the front is still finishing off, right, the previous previous turn. You can see the complete difference of timing here. And then my turn shape at the back, you know, I'm all, I'm coming back across the hill where the skier in front is still coming down the hill. So I've shrunk the vertical drop, increased my speed on the arc. So I'm actually skiing faster if you were to put a, a radar gun on me. Um, however, coming down the mountain, I'm actually coming down slower. It would take me longer to get down the mountain. And I, to, in my opinion, that is expert skiing. All right. So you see, we actually both get to the same part. You know, the width of the corridor remain the same. Um, and then from here, uh, as we go, you know, the skier at the back ends up exiting stage right <laughs> at that point. So uh, a few key things here, objective-based skiing, we're going to talk about width of corridor, we're talking about the vertical drop in our corridor, we talk about whether the turn is carved or less carved or skidded or drifted, whatever terminology you like to use, and then also speed, right? There's speed on an arc, so how fast you're going on the arc itself, and then there's rate of descent, how fast you're coming down the mountain. Okay, there you go. I know it's a bit of a, <clears throat> a longer video, but it's a little bit easier to, to record those in advance so I can slow motion and, and that sort of thing to hopefully you know, help guide your eye to, to what it was. So objective-based skiing, real simple. We talk about corridor width, how far across the hill you go. There's the vertical drop. There's carved versus less, less carved, skidded, drifted, however you uh, like to refer to, to that terminology, and then fast or slow on the arc itself. We're going to we'll review a little bit more of this uh, you know, in, the, in the summary at the end. Uh, but let's, uh, let's move along here. So now what we're going to, in the next video I'm going to show you is what we do and why we do it. Okay, so I'm, when what we do is, is with the ski itself, okay, um, what I've been able to, to do <laughs> is cut off the, uh, the video of my skiing from the boots up, okay, and so all we're going to do is we're going to look at what happens when the ski tips over and what that does for our turn shape. So that's the, the basis of this next one, um, and then we're going to talk, there's a, I, I say there's a tiny bit of science in there, I think I use words like resultant force and momentum. Um, but at the end of the day, for me, if, if uh, you know, if we're going down the mountain, if we don't actually do something with the skis, i.e. tip them over or twist them, we're not on an arc. And other than just basic friction from the wind and the ground, uh, the snow, uh, there really isn't a ton of, uh, of forces to talk about like we would normally uh, as we're on an arc. So first and foremost, most importantly, what do we do with our skis? So we've talked about objective-based skiing, right? So creating different turn shapes and different levels of ski performance uh, that we'll use all day, all the time, depending on what terrain we're on and where we want to go and how fast we want to get there and, and so on and so forth. So um, now let's look at 
what we do, right? And it all comes down to the ski and how the ski interacts with the snow, which is what's going to give us our turn shape and our, our skiing objective that we've already talked about. So we're using a carved arc here as an example because that would be the essence of what the ski design is designed to do. So we're going to talk about a carved arc and engaging the, uh, the ski design on that carved arc. Uh, for this discussion, uh, and for this video that I'm using, it's a soft packed, groomed uh, snow so the ski can sink in to the snow a little bit and it's a blue slope. So there's no worry about speed control. Uh, so where the, the pure design of the ski can actually control my arc. Now we don't look at this this camera angle very often and so what I've done is I've taken away everything from the boots up as best as possible on this video. So you're really just looking at the ski. You'll see the ski tip over, you'll see the ski bend, and you'll see an arc as a result. And we'll get a little bit deeper into it as we go of course as we take a look at it. But there it is. That's the ski tipping over, bending, and creating an arc. Okay, so now let's look at this a little bit more. So where are we looking in the action of the ski tipping over? You know, it happens throughout the whole arc, but where we can see it as an example right here through transition from one set of edges to the new set of edges. And that's basically it. Okay, so we're going to look a little bit closer. We'll start where the ski is flat on the snow and let's take a look at the ski. What is it doing? How is it interacting with the snow? And what's the resultant arc as a result? Okay, so we take a look here. The ski is flat and uh, it starts to tip over. The ski tips over a little bit and you can see it starting to sink into the snow. There's a slight bend in the ski starting to occur, but this is very early on. So there's a little bit of an edge angle. Ski is digging in. As it goes a little bit further and the ski tips over more, now you can see that ski bending, right? And as a result, now it's starting to describe an arc for us. And you can see that there and the, and the direction that we're starting to, to take on that particular arc. And then as we progress, the ski gets steeper, you know, the, it tips over and there's the, the arc that's described as a result. Now we draw both lines in the snow because both skis have a contribution to the arc itself. Of course, we want to stand more in the middle of the outside ski. Uh, that's where we feel more of our weight balanced. Uh, but at the end of the day, both skis actually have a play in the, uh, the turn shape itself. Okay, so now we've directed the skis flat again, and let's get a little bit more uh, science-based <laughs> as, as we go here. And I don't talk uh, deep into all of the, all of the forces, uh, because at the end of the day, if we were to go straight down the mountain and we don't have any arc at all, we're just going straight. Sure, there's air friction, there's friction of the skis in the snow and gravity pulling us down the mountain. But at the end of the day, if we're not on an arc, then we're not going to get the forces such as centripetal force and, and those types of forces. So, um, and we don't get on an arc unless we create that, unless we tip the skis over and get them to interact with the snow in a way that creates a direction change on an arc. And in order to do that, we have to make that happen. Okay. So that's why I don't get super, super deep in it because we're in control. It's our job to direct the skis and how they're tipped up on the snow or maybe even turned. And I'll talk about that as well. Amen. You know, for the, for the most part, you know, from this point here, the skis are flat. They tip over. We're changing direction because of how that ski is interacting. The ski design, you know, the, the width of the, the side cut tipped over how that ski bends just from our body weight, right? Our body weight will, will bend the ski relative to how much it's, it's tipped over. And that's, you know, how it interacts with the snow given our momentum, which is our, our speed with direction times our, our mass, right? Um, and that gives us that uh, resultant force. Right? So we have a resultant force at the snow, which will eventually push us in the direction that the, uh, the ski design ultimately uh, describes for us. And it's pushing us away from our current line of momentum. So that's what you see here. And uh, as the ski bends and creates that arc again, then what we need to do next is we need to align ourselves to balance on that ski 
that is uh, creating the art for us. So uh, now what I want you to do is I'm going to um, give you a moment to, and pause these a few times in between is so you know, going back to the start here where the ski has been rolled to flat right from previous edges we've gone to flat okay what I want you to do picture in your mind at this point how have I aligned or my body how have I moved my body to end up balancing at this point in the arc so let's take a look here All right so there we are there's the skis and boots only and then bam okay there's where oops sorry that's where we get to from there. And what we call this is anticipation, right? So there's a little bit of counter left over from the previous arc as the ski has been directed from edges to flat. And that's called anticipation. So when you see you know, us balancing this way, that's called anticipation. So let's see what happens next. All right, so now again, the ski is tipped over a little bit further. Now before I let the screen go up again, you know, picture in your mind, what are you going to see? How do I need to align to be balanced on a ski that's tipping over more and starting to bend and create that, that turn shape? There you have it, right? So the body naturally is going to be tipped over because we've got that stiff boot attached to the binding of the ski. So when the ski tips over, everything aligns with it. So the body, you know, seems relatively long. It's stacked. People like to, to use that type of, of terminology. Now here we go a little bit further through the arc. We're maybe a little bit past the fall line at this point. That line is, is getting even steeper, right? So we tip the ski over a little bit more. How do I align and balance to that? Well, the same thing, right? We let the body continue to, to tip over and, uh, and, you know, balance on that, uh, on that new edge. And where do we go from here now? Forces are starting to get a little bit greater as we've talked about, right? And now what happens is with that steepness, as the ski gets steeper and steeper and steeper along this line, I have to connect, I have to stay balanced to that outside ski. And that's where we see some of these angles starting to form in the outside of the body. Okay. And now let's talk about you know, an, uh, you know, other alignments as well. So that's kind of, you know, how we align as we're tipping the, the skis over. And then let's take a look in here. So now as I'm going to start to tip the skis again, this, sorry, that arrow is hard to place, but it's, you know, you know, showing how I'm going to start to tip the ski over onto its new edges or back towards, you know, a flatter ski, right? So there it is tipping over to a flatter ski. So here we go, this angle here. So I always have, shin contacts. So you're always going to have a little bit of an angle uh, in the ankle joint for sure. And then I also need a bit of an angle here you know, in the knee joint. And in order to tip that ski over further, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later on in another video, but if I have these bends in the joints here, that engages muscle groups that are going to be the most efficient and effective way to tip the ski over. Okay, so as we ski through transition and we're tipping the ski over, you know, from old edges onto a flat ski and then a little bit further, we try to maintain this sort of bend in the, uh, in the joints there. Okay. And then again, we start to, to tip over. And one of the other ways that we have to align, so we had that side to side, we have the alignment in the joints, and uh, now we've got this alignment in the pelvis. Okay, so how I want you to think of this is when the skis start to arc, well, everything has to turn on that arc as well. We know we don't turn the pelvis before the skis start to arc because then that would be our traditional rotation, right? But it needs to stay aligned on that arc so we don't get too open and fall back to the inside and, and a whole bunch of things like that. So we'll look at that alignment, that rotational alignment again through here. So like I said before, there's a little bit of anticipation but we're really aligned um, in the direction of travel because the side cut of the ski and the design of the ski is still on an arc greater than where we're aligned with the pelvis, right, or our hips. And then again, that uh, rotational alignment as we start our new platform, uh, again, is starting to travel on the arc, the same sort of arc that the skis is traveling on as well. So let's look here at the ski design, like just in its purest form. Now, this is in the gym. 
uh, and it would represent a very firm deck, right? The ski isn't going, yeah, as the previous part of the video where the, the snow, snow was soft enough so that my body weight would actually help the ski. It would sink into the snow and therefore get a little bit more bend. In this situation, the grant, you know, the ski is not going to sink into this, this surface. So as a result, you know, the, the, the turn shape or the, the arc that that ski is going to create is not very round, is it? When you take a look at it. And this is a slalom ski. So this is a 13 meter radius ski. Okay, on a super, super hard deck. <laughs> As you look at it, you know, some very, very firm ice. So there it is from there, right? This, the, uh, the side cut pushing down and that's the, the arc that you get. So if you need to, and we talked about this in the, in the objective, uh, video that, you know, sometimes we have to twist the ski. We have to turn the ski on the surface of the snow um, as we're starting to tip it over or before we tip it over to help us create the turn shape that we need to control our speed or get us, you know, going across the slope wherever we want it to go. And then as the ski bends on that new, you know, how I've turned it across that pure carved line, well, there's your new turn shape that you're going to get. And that's the direction that the, uh, the ski design is going to take you. So let's take a look uh, and we'll discuss it just a little bit more and uh, move on from there on to a new video. All right. Uh, so there you go. That's the, you know, what do we do? We tip the ski over. If we have to turn it, we turn it as much as required to achieve the, the turn objective that we talked about earlier on. So real quick review here. Number one, what do we do? Ski has to tip over. Every ski is tipped over. Even if you're a beginner skier, as soon as you displace your feet or turn into a, uh, a wedge position, both skis are on edge, your ski design is already engaged. So the ski has to, to tip over. Why? Because it engages the ski design. And when the ski design starts to bend and start to affect, and that resultant force that we talked about, the ski bends, right? And that bending of the ski, and I always say, thank you, side cut. Uh, this is, you know, this is not, um, you know, the straight skis that I, I passed my level four on straight skis, you know, and, you know, this type of movement pattern wouldn't work. Uh, as well <laughs> efficiently or effectively on a straighter ski um, but that's not the reality that we're in today the reality we're in today is we're on skis with side cut um, so when that ski bends it digs into the snow creates grip if i twist it a bit there's also friction uh, involved there as well and that's what's changing our direction on an arc uh, the resultant force at the snow what you feel that's what's pushing us away from going straight down the hill in the direction of where the ski is going. We balance against the ski. So now the ski's, it's got an arc. And unless you change the edge angle or twist the ski at all, that ski is going on that arc. That's a, the shape that you're going to be on. So now it's our job to balance against that. And when we looked at that, it's, uh, you know, there's on a few things, you know, different ranges, the way we balance side to side, the way we balance and align our joints, you know, how much they're bent or not bent, and then also our rotational axis as well. And all of these are to balance against that resultant force. So now um, you're on that arc, you're balanced on that arc, and the next thing you need to do, well, now you have to, you've slowed down, you're heading in the direction that you want to go. Now you've got to undo that and tip the skis uh, onto the new set of edges. Every action uh, that we do are intentional, right? Everything that we'll talk about tonight in the next video, uh, they're all intentional actions, right? Nothing happens for free out there. We make our direction change or we make the, the direction of our skis, uh, how much they're tipped over, how much they're twisted. Um, that's up to us. That's 100% up to us. And lastly, uh, and I've already mentioned it, that uh, you know, if that pure carve, uh, isn't going to control your speed, keep you safe, uh, then you're going to have to turn the ski a little bit more and uh, and then set your edges or as you turn, you set the edges in the edge angle, uh, get the ski to bend and to grip a little bit for you. So that's something that we have to do, not all the time, but when the uh, the ski design itself just isn't enough to take us where we need to go. So we're going to look at a, the third video now, the last video. Uh, technique 
it's a set of actions. It defines actions. It doesn't define exactly a picture. And in all my years with the Interski program, I had the good fortune of being involved with four Interskis, uh, coaching a wonderful group of people. And at those uh, Interski events, I always had the pleasure of sitting with other coaches and, and other demonstrators. And, you know, when you watch any country ski down the demo slope, uh, no two skiers are exact. Now they look similar, but they don't look exactly the same because of, sometimes they're on different equipment. Very Most of the time they have the same skis on, but um, more often they're different sizes, right? We've got people over six feet. We've got people around five foot. We've got people who are stronger, uh, people who are less strong, people have more mass, people who have less mass. And so as a result, um, things are going to look different. You know, when I broke my leg, when I came back from my broken leg, uh, I certainly didn't look the same because I couldn't move the same way as I did pre-break. And then, you know, over time, I've been able to to get that back. Uh, but the, how I looked would look a little bit different, maybe because of an injury, some sort of physical limitation. So technique defines a set of actions, uh, creates common motor patterns, um, but it doesn't give us an exact Picture. So, you know, what I encourage you to do when you watch these videos or there's a whole bunch on YouTube, there's great stuff out there uh, at the, your sessioners at your snow school, uh, your course conductors on, on courses, um, you know, they're look at the movements that they're using. Um, you can look at the general way that they look as a result of those movements, but it's not something that you want to uh, try to put your body exactly the way their body is because yours may or may not be able to. Okay, um, so let's take a look at the technique video here. This one's quite a bit shorter and uh, we'll go from there. You know, skiing is actually quite simple, right? When it's based on the foundation of these principles where, you know, if you're skiing and you're on the uphill ski, you're gonna have a bad day. And, but if you can get yourself to the downhill ski or the outside ski, you're going to have a pretty good day. And if you can get yourself aligned where your tip to tail pressure is equal, then you're going to have a great day. I have three points of contact that tell me whether or not I'm balanced. And uh, it starts at the foot, right? And the first spot would be the first met head. I definitely need to feel contact of that part of the foot inside the boot. And the second contact point is the heel pad. And it doesn't really matter where you're distributing your pressure. Um, you know, sometimes it might shift more towards the med head, more towards the heel pad. But neither of those two points ever go to zero. The third point of contact is the shin in the front of the boot. And it doesn't matter where I am on the arc. Uh, I always feel that on both legs. And again, similar to the bottom of the foot, pressure distribution will change a little bit more, a little bit less, but you never go to zero. Right, so if our first move is always here, trying to get that ski tipped over flat or over further onto its new edge angle, then we have to be balanced in the right position to have access to the muscles that are going to do that for us most efficiently and most effectively. So it starts here by you know, the shin on the front of the boot, but then I lower straight down until the glutes are engaged. When my glutes are engaged, that's what gives me access to the adductor group of muscles, which is what I use to roll the foot over. So expanding on the idea about your know, balance from the tip to the tail is the idea that we, where our pelvis turns is where we actually have pressure more towards the tip or more towards the tail. So if I have my you know, balance here, and I'm on my three points of contact, so my first met head, my heel pad, and also my shin, if I turn my pelvis down the hill, I'm actually moving towards the back of my ski, more towards the tail. And if the pelvis turns towards the, towards the tips a little bit more, now my balance actually shifts more towards the front of the ski. So controlling our balance from tip to tail is easier to control this way, right, rotationally in the pelvis, than it is trying to move the body forwards and backwards. So this is our controller of balance between the tip and tail. 
as we roll the ski over, all right, and we tip everything over, you know, my hand here represents kind of my pelvis area. That in, you know, that idea to balance to the outside foot, you know, to get to that outside ski is simple. As I tip everything over, you see my weight shifts here, but if my upper body tips this direction towards the outside, I call this connecting to the outside foot, that's where we get this angle from. It's from tipping the base of the ski over and balancing against it with the upper body. As a person, I'm a little bit of a control freak and uh, that doesn't really change at all in skiing. I always want to be in control of my destiny, right? How much I tip the ski over, how much I twist it on the snow. And that will then also guide my turn shape and, and level the ski performance. Uh, it's the timing of when I transfer weight from one ski to the next. So that new ski becomes the, the turning ski or the primary ski that I balance against. You know, even at slower speeds, you know, as I roll the ski flat, you know, right in here as an example. And then so I stay a bit taller so I can twist it. And that creates friction, which helps me control my speed and my turn shape. Potentially, it's how much I, I turn the ski to create a short radius turn. It's intentional of when, when I connect to the outside ski, how much I move to connect to the outside ski. And that varies based on my edge angle and how fast I'm going and how the forces are, are acting uh, against my ski and, and pushing me around the arc. There we go. Um, so great, you know, as we, we look at, you know, some of those actions that we, we have in skiing, we're always trying to uh, balance, of course, right? That it's a balancing game, this skiing thing that we have. Uh, inside the boot, we've got those three points of contact, uh, the first met head, your heel pad, your shins. If you can sense those at all times, there's a good chance that rotationally, uh, side to side, say, and uh, you know, you're you're going to be balanced, right? It gives you a, a, a just a target to uh, to shoot for as far as balancing goes. We tip the skis over. We have to align rotationally on the arc as we go, and we connect to the outside ski. Keep balanced on the outside ski, and all movements again are intentional. These are things that I choose to do again relative to the target or my ski objective. Well, let's put this in context of our end user, right? The people that we're teaching on snow. So why, why do we have a skiing objective? Why is that so important? Well, it defines our target. If I was to give you a dart and uh, say, you know, throw it against the wall and uh, hit the target, but there is no dartboard up, right? You're going to look at me and you're going to say, well, where am I supposed to send this? What, what is this move? I could teach you how to throw a dart, but what's the purpose if there's no target and that's what it does and if i can clearly define the results of you know what my actions are going to do i can really zoom things in and get specific with the bullseye and if the bullseye is painted clearly for our students then there's a good chance that they're going to be able to achieve that objective so when we start talking about the movements the what we do simplified actions as we've been talking tonight if they're as simple as they can be uh, and there's a target for them to go towards, then that student has an opportunity to understand uh, what I call contrib contribution and effect, right? If I give this move, then this is what's supposed to happen. I can measure that. I can evaluate that as a student and also as the teacher, we can see that coming, right? Um, and technique, again, the, the technique, I, I've stripped it down to the, the basics, uh, the foundation. Are there other little moves in there? Sure, there might be at times, but this is the foundation, right? This is the core of technique. A couple of simple moves, a defined action, a defined objective as a result of those moves, what it does for us. And if we have a clear technique, then we're defining the most efficient, efficient and effective way to ski. So keep skiing simple. Um, there's, I remember when, uh, I, shortly after passing my level four, I was doing a photo shoot for a manual and the person taking the photos was asking me to take different angles and did that. And 
when he asked me what I was thinking about skiing, I must have rolled out a scroll uh, a mile long. To, and I, I talked about everything I'd ever heard in every session and, and every course that I had taken. And as I grew from that moment, uh, I realized that, uh, you know, some of those are makeup movements for mistakes that I had or for movements that I didn't have in my skiing. And so a lot of the time, some of the things that we work on in our skiing is a Band-Aid fix for the fact that we might be missing one of these fundamental pieces that we talked about here tonight. So try to keep it simple. Objective base gives us that target. Utilize the ski design. Every skier does, even our beginners, right? The ski bends um, and it helps us with direction change. Don't fight that, right? Embrace it, utilize it. Everybody's going to have a much easier day uh, if they can get that, you know, balanced on that ski. And that doesn't mean that it has to be pure carved all the time, right? It can still be a nice, easy skidded arc on a green run, an easy blue run, even on a black run. And everything that you do, make it intentional, right? Nothing comes for free. You roll the ski over. There's a time to do that. There's a, an amount to do it. And there's a, a rate in which you do that. We'll talk more about that in the upcoming sessions. Our next two sessions, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, I hope that uh, maybe, you know, helps you change the way you think or makes you think a little bit differently about what it is you're, you're trying to do on your skis this season. Um, going back to the, the first statement that I made, that uh, to change your skiing, the first thing you have to do is to change the way you think about it, or you're just going to follow the same old motor patterns that you had. Uh, I've got a, a, a the, the uh, Ontario board said, uh, you know, do I can advertise a couple of my camps here, so I'm going to. Um, I've got a really neat function coming up, uh, the Ultimate Ski Congress at uh, Mont Saint Anne in January. Uh, I've got eight coaches from around the world, an Austrian, Australian, from the U.S., myself, Manny Osborne, four-time Olympians going to be there. Um, it's a really cool opportunity to get different perspectives, which is what this was all about, right? It's trying to, to change and, and learn something new. So you'll be in a group of people of your ability level, and uh, you'll get a different coach each day. So you'll get an opportunity to experience four different coaches and uh, to gain more knowledge and insight from what they think about skiing. I've got a four day camp at Lake Louise in March um, and then also a couple of international camps, but you can check me out at uh, warrenjobbit.com and uh, love to hear from you. If you have any questions or, or comments, um, please, that would be uh, that would be great. But that concludes the, the presentation. I'm going to flip it back over to AJ. Awesome. Warren, you've got audio for me again. Perfect. Um, thanks so much. That was fantastic. I, uh, I'll, I'll buy you a moment to grab a, a sip of water and get your breath. Um, but I, yeah, to everyone else on the line, I hope you've uh, thoroughly enjoyed. Um, I'm seeing a couple of comments come through in the chat. We're going to try to grab questions uh, in the Q&A here. So if you've got something you'd like to post up as a, as a question for Warren, I will start sort of combing through those and publishing them so Warren's able to see and we'll sort of call those questions out in order. Um, but if, you, if you've if you added a question to the chat and you're able to bring it over into the Q&A, it just helps it from getting buried um, as people comment and, you know, and chat amongst themselves. So Warren, I'm going to post up questions and publish some as they come. Um, so you should see some in the published questions area. And to others on the line, if, if there's a question that's been asked that aligns with something that you're curious about, you can give it the thumbs up. And, and questions with a higher vote count, just if we happen to get a few of them piled up here, questions with a higher vote count with more thumbs up, maybe it's just the easiest ones to uh, to grab for Warren to start. So we have a couple, um, Ewan's sort of chimed in with just thoughts around this, is twisting the same as pivoting? And then he comments later about steering, pivoting, tipping, twisting, uh, turning. Just lots of verbs to understand, as he said. And, and Warren, maybe you can, there's not a definite question there, but if you want to speak to that, just some of the terminology and, and some of the wording you were using in your presentation tonight, just to make sure that everyone's clear on what you were going for. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. You know, there's um, you know, pivoting yeah, it, it, traditionally um, has been defined by, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the CSIA as turning the leg in the hip socket. So that's the action of pivoting. That's the definition of pivoting itself. When I talk about twisting the ski on the snow, 
Um, I'm talking very specifically about what the ski is doing on the snow. So um, as an example, when in that one video where I had the atomic ski on the hard floor, you know, on the line drawn and then turning the ski. So that's that to me is twisting the ski. Um, that can be done uh, through pivoting. Absolutely. You know, turning the leg in the hip socket. I can turn my upper body first to and then the ski can can twist on the snow. Um, so there are more efficient and effective ways to do that. Obviously, you know, for you know, 80 plus years, the, the CSA has defined uh, turning with the lower body as the most efficient and effective way to do it. Um, you know, and so has the rest of the world. In reality, I haven't seen anybody uh, in the interskis that I've been to talk about uh, starting their turn with the with the upper body. So yeah, so I, I'm I'm when I say twisting, I'm specifically referring to what the ski is doing on the surface of the snow. It's twisting. Um, you can say turning, um, and the action. You know, it, you know, if it's led with the lower body, the leg and the hip socket, you could certainly call that pivoting. Um, getting a little bit more specific, you know, we, you know, in your next question here about steering, pivoting, twisting, um, yeah, lots of verbs to understand for sure, right? And if if you take it down to what's your goal with the ski, right? Are you trying to get it to point in the new direction faster than it's going to bend and point you there? Um, that's what I refer to as twisting. Um, you know, the, the turns can be skidded, they can be drifted. Steered means there's a little bit of, you know, that the twisting action and the tipping and the bending of the ski combined to steer. There's been a lot of words out there over the years. Um, so what I would, what I, what I'd highly recommend is find a, a description that works for you, right? That describes what exactly are you trying to have the ski do? If you want to call it pivoting, uh, you, you can call it pivoting. If you want to call it twisting, skidded, drifted, carved, uh, whatever it might be. But if it's describing the ski and you are very specific with your students as to what you want them to do, the turn objective, then I think the words, you know, it, you know become a little less important. Um, and we don't need that, uh, you know, the, to pick exactly one um, as long as your students can relate to it and as long as you can explain it relative what the ski is doing. Awesome, Warren. Um, we've got uh, one Bill's put up for us. Uh, he's got a few other people have sort of jumped on board with him. So uh, some pleasantries there. He's happy to see you again. But he's wondering if uh, you think about what the inside ski is doing at the end or beginning of the turn. I hear a lot about moving the inside ski back and tip to get out of the way and keep these skis parallel. Mm. Um, maybe you can provide some insight there. Yeah, I love this one. Um, you know, so uh, my 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 opinion is this: if you are properly aligned on your outside ski, um, that's you know the four you know the bends in the joints. Um, whether or not you've transferred, you've got more weight on your outside ski uh, than your inside ski. Rotationally aligned as well relative to the arc that you're on. Um, then the inside leg, because we're attached to this big, strong bone that hopefully doesn't move uh, or go in two opposite directions, the pelvis, um, that uh, your inside leg is going to be uh, on the right track. Now, people talk about, you know, parallel skis, you know, the, you know, the longitudinally parallel edges and parallel legs. Um, in my opinion, that's the, that's the unicorn of skiing that uh, me personally... Uh, when I sit on a chairlift, you know, my ski, if I'm in the middle of the chair, my ski tips are going to be in front of both of the people uh, beside me because of my, uh, my own body, the way, the way my body works. Uh, so when I point my ski straight, naturally, I'm on the inside uh, edges. Um, so my, my, my legs, if you look at my legs, you could freeze frame in a whole bunch of my turns. You likely wouldn't see it um, or hopefully not see it too much when in a moving video. Uh, but in some stills, the, the legs are not perfectly parallel, but the alignment to, to and how I balance on the outside ski. So the edge angle that I've developed and uh, this, you know, the twisting or turn of the ski as well. So that ski is taking me where I need to go. Uh, that's what's most important. So uh, when people start to uh, work the inside leg because it's in the way, it's not well, 100 percent of the time. 
It's because you're not aligned properly on the outside leg or the ski that you've just turned over and created uh, to become your new outside and primary turning ski. Great, thanks. Thank you. Another, um, I'm sort of checking them off as answered as you go. So okay. um, Andrew Primo was asking just a little bit of clarity on I think a term you used off the start of the first video, which was uh, what do you exactly mean by vertical drop? Yeah, great one. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, the the vertical drop is, you know, for, if I'm going across the slope and I start my turn, how many meters or how far down the hill do I drop before my direction is taking me across the slope the other way? So where I want to be going. So, you know, if, um, if I can get a pure carve and in the least amount of vertical drop, uh, to me, that's utilizing the ski equipment. So that's how you know, it's the track on the snow. If you look back up or you climb back up and measured from when your skis were heading east to when they finally were heading west, the drop down from that line to the bottom line, that would be vertical drop. Awesome. Um, and we had another one here. Sorry, Warren, I just scrolled right past it. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more for Jay Park on the relationship you talked about between um, pelvis and pressure along the ski tip to tail? Um, I think just looking for a little bit, a little bit more understanding on what you were going at there, Warren. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I had a really cool opportunity to work with um, our national team, our, our uh, skier cross athletes, our Olympians last year, a couple of times. Um, and, and you know, there, when you watch the skiers, uh, it's very common for us to over counter, right? To, you know, to, to turn and look down outside the arc uh, too much because what that does is it takes the pressure off the front of the boot and goes all the way back into the heel pocket. And, but we get this false sense of, of success because, you know, with the shape of the skis and how wide the tail is now, um, that digs in and it pushes us around the corner and you, you stop at the bottom and you look up and you see a nice little pencil line in the snow and you think that's fantastic right um and so what happens then is if you know that that counter the dumping the hip the uh, and i hope not this isn't a bad word you can beep it out later in the recording aj but the ass to the grass i'm putting it in air quotes because other people use it um you know kind of idea when you move inside like that and down the pelvis is you're naturally going to counter um, our bodies will naturally counter for balance it's uh, something that that happens for you. Um, you'll do that quite a lot. You'll get to the tail of the ski. So um, as the if the pelvis as the ski starts to tip over and it starts to prescribe a new arc, you know we have to find those. You know if you're balanced on those three points of contact around the arc. You know, if my hand, this hand here, represents the front of my pelvis, then it has to eventually go on that arc as well. Hopefully that answers it. Yeah, great. And maybe Warren, just a couple of thoughts for Drew. Um, he was looking for a little bit of further insight on on how you know a, a racer or an athlete could use use that um, that turn shape to create some acceleration down the hill versus across. You know, you 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 talked about the difference, but how do you achieve one versus the other? Mm -hmm. That's a good one. And it's funny because I started my previous answer with, you know, working with the the national team athletes, um, and, and this will blend. This will go straight into it. If we align rotationally well, you know, properly, uh, as, as soon as we start to balance on that new outside ski, we start to, to change an arc, then the shovel bends, right? So the front of the ski is going to bend. We don't move forwards to make the shovel bend. And the more I tip the ski over, the waist bends and the shovel bends. That's the most efficient and effective way to get the front of the ski bending. So if that starts to pull us, you, you imagine a, a, a GS racer, the shovel's bending and it's pulling us down the mountain and towards the panel. The bulk of my uh, turn shape or the destiny of where I'm going to exit after the panel is done above the fall line. And if it's done above the fall line, we're actually skiing down the mountain with gravity. That's going to be the fastest. So if I can get a better turn shape done above the panel here, then I can release it straighter towards the next panel. And that's why I'm going to go faster. Um, as soon as our hooking and the, um, the, the bending or more of the bending of the ski is after the panel, that's going to redirect the momentum across the hill 
not down the hill. And that's what's going to slow our racers down. Um, we had a, a really cool training camp with, with those athletes. They went from a technical day with me and then the next day into GS. And just that simple alignment made, you know, they were visibly faster and were able to attain the, the, the fast line uh, that their coaches have been asking them to do with a, a simple tweak in how they're, they're balancing. And because the pelvis was a little bit squarer, um, they were, uh, you know, they were out of that, that habit where one of the, one of the, the Olympians said to me at the end said, okay, for 10 years, my coaches have been saying, get your hips forward, get your hips forward. And, you know, you can imagine yourself looking at a skier going past you in the fall line and you're looking at them from the side of the hill. Um, if you open the hips, that outside or the pelvis, that outside hip is way behind the heel piece. If you rotate or align it properly um, with still a little bit of counter in there, the pelvis or the hip, that outside hip is actually more forward. Um, and so, you know, within a, a run, uh, they, they were able to fix those 10 years of coaches telling them to get in the front seat, you know, move your hips forward. Because when you move your hips forward, you try to move and project your hips forward, you know, from tip to tail longitudinally, um, then you'll always get too far ahead. Then you, what happens to balance is you're actually going to push your hips further back to balance the fact that you've got all this weight going too far forward for you. So that's why I talk about the, uh, the pelvis being the controller of the uh, tip to tail uh, balance and pressure distribution. Awesome. So uh, Warren, we've got two quick ones for you and then two that are a little bit more meat on the bone. Uh, and then I think we'll, we'll aim towards wrapping ourselves for the evening. So uh, Debbie was curious to hear your thoughts on just equipment choice, like stiffness of the ski boot. How stiff do you feel you like to be working in a boot or, or maybe what you see with some of the, the athletes and uh, trainees you're working with? Yeah. Um, you know, I'll give you my, my progression. Uh, I went from, um, you know, as a young racer being in the stiffest boot at the time, because you, that was it, right. When I raced downhill as a 14 year old, I had two 23s and, a and a race boot on. Um, and I did not do very well. There's, there's a reason why I didn't make it much further than that in racing. Um, and then I progressed, you know, so I had that sort of stiff boot, uh, thought process all the way through my, you know, my growth as a, through the CSI levels. Um, and it wasn't until after uh, passing the level four, when I started to go from a 150 flex, 140, and I'm down into a 130 now, um, you know, ironically, my body weight is twice that of what it was when I was younger, um, you know, as a, as a racer, and I'm into a into a softer boot. Uh, I find that I need to have, you know, the, the ability for the boot to bend. Uh, it allows me to get to the angles that I need to through transition, um, you know, the bending, you know, that to, to have the glutes engaged and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, probably for most of us, uh, you know, getting into a, you know, up to a 130 uh, sort of flex is probably plenty, but you're going to, it's personal preference. Um, there's also, you know, how much mobility do you have in your ankle as well? So there's a little bit of, of your own physiology that will dictate uh, the stiffness of your boot. Um, but if you can't stand outside on, you know, on a minus 20 day uh, and have some range of flexion in your boot, then you're likely in something a little bit too stiff. Great. Um, and Ken Harper, again, looking for a little bit of clarity, I think, on terminology. But does, does tipping mean using the intentional movement of the ankle to begin the turn? Or, or your reference to tipping in your video, what were you getting at there? Correct. Uh, good one. Uh, that's a great one to clarify. You know, when I say tipping, it's tipping the ski over, right? Remember, we're talking about the actions that will get the ski to tip over. Um, there was a brief piece in there where I talked about, um, you, you know, that, you know, if I have a stance that uh, there's got some flexion in the joints where the glutes engage, then I have the uh, access to my adductor group of muscles, which squeeze, you know, if you were to squeeze your legs together, that's the adductor group of muscles. So that will start to, to drive the ski or tip the ski over a little bit. Then there's the internal rotators. The, the femur will rotate in the, in the hip socket a little bit as well. And then you've got muscles inside your feet up along your shin, right. That also help tip the, the, the ski over. So um, those are the, the pieces of the puzzle to get the ski 
uh, tipped over. And those are the actions, the adduction, internal rotation of the femur and, you know, the little muscles in your feet to also tip the foot over as well. Great. Um, Rob was playing Super Sleuth in uh, one of the videos and he noticed some of your uh, wizardry or witchcraft there. A little bit of a lift of that inside uh, tail of the inside ski. And he was just curious to understand a little bit more. Is that is that to create a more positive connection with the outside ski worn? Um, at times, it, you, you know, I've, I don't intentionally uh, lift that ski up. So, um, you know, when it does happen, I've uh, probably, you know, needed to, to realign a bit more aggressively than, than normal. And that would, you know, lighten the inside ski a bit more, pick the tail up. It's, it's certainly not uh, an intentional move. It's there sometimes. It's not there all the time. Uh, when I do see it, it cues me in to, to recognize that I've probably made a, a, a bigger motor pattern to get balanced on the outside ski. And that's why the inside ski kind of lifts that way. Awesome. And then uh, we'll wrap up after this question. So I just got a couple of closing marks afterwards. Uh, thanks for everyone who stuck around still. But uh, Kurt threw one in there for you, Warren, and that was um, your thought around carving for speed control. Um, you were talking about turn shape and speed across versus down the hill. What sort of ability level are you bringing that thought forward with your guests? Um, as opposed to just, let's say, scrubbing speed or, or a little bit of a, a skid at the start of the turn to, to control their pace? Mm -hmm. You know, it uh, obviously when you start, you know, I, I would work this, um, you know, in our world, you know, start it with level twos, you know, people who can uh, understand how to, to, to create uh, an edge and, and know what it feels like for the ski to, to grip the snow uh, and not skid on the arc and where you can just balance on that gripping ski and turn it across because after that because the the, the action from let's see this will be my downhill ski over here <laughs> all right the action to roll the skis over at some point i have to um, have enough speed and confidence to go all you know further across to get the ski as the angle as steep as required to get that to go so uh, a lot of it, it's not so much the ability level per se. Once the once you can get somebody carving on a green run, um, then I start to to introduce that that concept uh, as as early as possible. Awesome, awesome. Well, for where we've gotten to tonight, I think we've covered all of our questions, Warren. So I wanted to start by saying thanks so much for coming on out tonight and uh, entertaining us, getting the brains in gear at the start of the season here. Um, for everybody online with us, thanks so much for being here. We hope you've really enjoyed tonight's session with Warren. Um, as I was sharing at our kickoff, we do have two more Tech Talk evenings coming for you. Um, one will be on the 17th and one will be on the 21st. Promos for those will start rolling out likely as early as tomorrow. If you had signed up for a Tech Talk with us previously, you'll get an email in, uh, notification about that. So you can just uh, sort of one or two clicks from that email. Um, sign yourself up again for a further session. Um, we'll also blast it out through social media channels and make it shareable online for other people to get to it. So if you, uh, if you happen to have missed tonight live and you're catching it as a replay um, and you still have time to sign up for the 17th or 21st, we'd love to have you there live so you can ask some questions. Um, but to everybody that's been on the line tonight, really hope you've enjoyed. And uh, if you're looking forward to, uh, to hearing more, come on back on the 17th. Uh, and I think Warren also put you on to a couple of great camps that he's offering this season if you want to check those out with him. So on behalf of CSI Ontario, uh, myself, AJ here, and of course Warren, really appreciate you being here tonight and uh, have a great rest of your evening and an awesome weekend. Hope you get out on snow. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening.